Today I have the pleasure of speaking with Constantine Karanopoulos from Neo Performance Materials. How are you today, Constantine? Hello, Tracy. I'm very well. And how are you? Constantine, as always, I've been enjoying watching your milestones since you came out of retirement to become the CEO, again, for Neo Performance Materials. But at the beginning of, at the onset of this interview, I'd like to bring up the recent news in the industry about a passing of one of your friends, John Landreth. I wondered if you wanted to say something to our audience about uh, uh, his unfortunate uh, passing. Sure. Um, thank you, Tracy. John was a friend and he was one of the really, really good people, great professionals in the rare earth industry. He spent virtually his entire career as a geologist uh, for Molly Corp. He's done tremendous work around the mountain pass deposit. He's been to pretty well every uh, rare earth deposit around the world and he's had views on those deposits. I remember during my involvement with him, I, I sent him to Africa on a couple of uh, expeditions of, uh, of deposits. And he was always a, a really nice, rational, calm man who believed in facts and rational analysis. And it's, it's a great loss for the industry. He, you know, he didn't grab the headlines. He never made a lot of noise but he was a consummate professional. And for those of us who, who knew him and, and worked with him, uh, we will miss him terribly. I thank you so, so much for your commentary on John Constantine. Now, with regards to near performance, every time I turn around, I see some really large numbers. Let's see, you recently announced a 70.9 million bot deal secondary offering of common shares. And in December, we saw a similar head headline for 47.6 million uh, in bought deal secondary offerings of common shares. Can you talk to our audience about what this really means? Sure. Um, when I joined, again, the company as CEO in the summer, um, one of the problems that I recognized uh, immediately, and I had been talking to the board about it when I was chairman of the company. Uh, and incidentally, for governance purposes, I stepped down from the chair of NEO when I took over the, um, the CEO seat. The new chairman at NEO is Claire Kennedy, uh, a, a great professional, uh, tremendous board skills and a great chair. Um, so one of the fundamental problems I, I saw with the company is the fact that we had very limited liquidity uh, in the, as a public company. And, and that stemmed from the fact, a few other reasons as well, but the main fact was that 70% of the equity of NEO was owned by one large fund um, in California called Oak Tree. Uh, and those uh, in the financial industry would be very familiar with Oak Tree, a uh, very successful fund over the years. Um, so I've had a number of conversations with Oaktree about the wisdom of reducing Oaktree's share in the company and allowing more shares to circulate in, in the market and therefore improving the liquidity. And so far, that, that thesis has, has held uh, correct. Uh, we, we, uh, following our, fourth, our third quarter results release in November, um, we, we put together a, a roadshow. Uh, we built uh, a book for about round numbers, $50 million, $12.10 a share. Uh, <clears throat> Oak Tree uh, sold um, just under 4 million shares. Uh, and immediately there was um, uh, the liquidity improved and the share, the share values continued to increase. Now, I won't claim full credit for that. The markets have been pretty frothy, I have to admit, over the last um, few weeks. So as that continued, um, we did, um, following another roadshow, virtual roadshow, of course, um, we, uh, we put together another secondary, this time closer to $80 million at uh, $15.75 a share. So it's, it's not normal that uh, you can have sec successive secondaries at uh, higher, successively higher prices. But I think this 
talks to the fact that the basic thesis was correct, that improved liquidity is helping the stock, but also the frothiness in the market, the, uh, the attention that's being paid to, uh, to rare earths again um, is uh, refreshing because um, the industry, when it comes to investor attention, it, there's a definite cyclicality. Um, and now, of course, with uh, Mountain Pass, uh, with their hugely successful uh, listing in New York through the SPAC deal they did in the summer, they're trading over $5 billion uh, market cap. I think there's a lot of folks that are paying attention and they realize that, you know, rare earths are a very interesting area to, to invest in. Um, the fundamentals are very much in the favor of the entire industry. And, you know, companies, especially like ours, that continue to execute and, you know, put uh, money to the bottom line, I think, should des and deserve the, the attention that they're getting. So our analyst uh, did a top five rare earth companies to watch globally and listed Neo Performance as number three. Uh, pointing out, of course, that you have the only processing facility outside of China. Now, I have a number of questions, of course, to ask you about this. Can you just talk to us a little bit about the frothy market and the rare earths market landscape that we currently have out there? Sure. Um, let me correct one observation that we have one of the two rare earth processing facilities outside of China. Linus, of course, in Malaysia is the biggest. Our plant in Estonia is uh, significantly smaller, but it's big enough for the purposes that it serves. And it is the only facility in Europe, uh, which in my mind, at least, it's, it's a very, very strategic asset. Um, the, the industry fundamentals, um, you know, we, we went through a really tough time uh, in earlier quarters, especially uh, affected by COVID, and it wasn't really a direct effect. I mean, I, it was the supply chains being affected by COVID, uh, and as consumer demand dropped, um, the inventory corrections, especially through the second quarter, by the time they got back to uh, suppliers like us in the earlier parts of supply chains, you know, that, they became a tsunami. And hence, uh, our second quarter was probably the, the only worst quarters that I could remember would be fourth quarter of 08, first quarter of 09, when the world was falling apart for completely different reasons. Um, and back then, we came back with a vengeance. Um, and it looks like the business is coming back pretty strongly. Um, Overall, I think you have some massive um, wind on, on our back, uh, and that's clearly the, the EV demand um, or demand by the EV industry, especially in China and Europe, where uh, the industry is growing at uh, very impressive rates, um, both in terms of consumers um, voting with their feet and buying more and more EVs, but also manufacturers and supply chains responding uh, to that demand and setting up supply chains in Europe now, because China has had those supply chains for five to 10 years. The, you know, we, we see significant demand growing growth in Europe. And of course, you know, North America is, uh, is a little slower to respond, but North America will get there. But there's no question that um, the EV industry has, has been the, the biggest demand trend in, in the rare earth uh, sector. Uh, at the same time, um, there was a, an unintended positive consequence from the lockdown. And as all of us work from home, demand for laptops, smart devices, uh, and so on has gone through the roof. So the plants that we own that, that supply either electronic materials or electronic rare earths or magnetic materials for micro motors inside uh, electronic devices and the like, we're, we're, they're running flat out. Um, and, and that's simply because consumers are buying smart devices and um, electronic devices at an unprecedented rate. 
Of course, one of the many catalysts that we've credited or some have speculated have been driving the rare earth markets have been the EV market, as you said, the smart devices. But where are we really in the supply chain uh, development, Constantine? There's a lot of hype out there in the media. There's a lot of misinformation. Um, we still don't have a supply chain for rare earths outside of China that's functioning uh, in North America. Can you comment on that? Um, yeah, I, I'll, I'll say the same thing that I've been saying for, for years. It took supply chains at least two decades to pack up and leave North America, uh, especially supply chains specific to our industry. It's going to take the better part of a decade if we start putting it together now. Uh, and unfortunately, we, you know, I, I'm very impressed by what the Europeans are doing, and I've said this before. Um, the, the efforts in North America are a little spottier. Uh, in Europe, and, and the Europeans had a fabulous experiment with uh, their battery uh, alliance, the European Battery Alliance, where they committed an awful lot of money you know, in north of 2 billion euros to attract global manufacturers throughout that battery supply chain. And now, you know, every big name in the EV battery sector has either built or is building uh, a plant somewhere in Europe to supply EV demand. Well, I think that's what it takes. Um, you know, friends uh, have called it a Manhattan style project as necessary. I mean, if we're serious about it, and if we really believe what we say, that um, uh, the, the, the future supply chains specific to electric vehicles and advanced manufacturing, advanced electronics, uh, depend on, on our ability to produce rare earths and perhaps more important, sophisticated materials from rare earths, um, we, we should have started a decade ago to be ready now, but you know, it's never too late. I think it, it will take a, con a concerted effort. Um, you, you see some efforts here and there, but they're specific to parts of the supply chain, like for example, uh, the Department of Defense in the United States uh, giving a, a contract to or giving a financial incentive to Linus to build a separation plant in Texas. Uh, still, the, the rest of the supply chain is empty. In other words, the, the rare, it's, it's good to start with rare earth production, but then those rare earths have to be converted into metals, alloys, magnetic materials, magnets, motors, and so on before they end up in a in a Tesla or a BYD or a Volkswagen uh, EV. So there's an awful lot of effort that that needs to continue to be um, expended in order to end up at some point with a fully integrated, fully functional supply chain in North America. And of course, I, there's no question that investor intel caters to the capital markets. And we have a lot of competing public markets right now that are uh, talking about the technology for the extraction of rare earths. We hear about the recycling to pull out the rare earths or the magnetic materials. We also hear about processing, pilot plants, and of course the exploration. As a sophisticated member of our community, can you tell us where you think investors should invest their time in getting to know this sector and where they might actually see their greatest uh, appreciation for their investment dollar. And this is where you can add that you are now offering your, the dividend process that you have at NEO Performance. Well, um, yeah, we NEO has always been making more money than we know what to do with it. So we, we've been paying a dividend to our shareholders and we've been uh, over the last couple of years, we, we had been buying back uh, our stock. Um, and in the meantime, now we're looking at a series of um, meaningful m and transactions that fit in together with what we do uh, in our uh, strategy throughout the supply chain. That's a different conversation for a different time. Uh, in the meantime, that's a, the, your question is pretty loaded, Tracy. Um, you know, I have my own views that I I would be very hesitant to make public. Um, I've been doing this for about 30 years. Uh, I've seen a lot of failures. I've seen a few successes. Um, and, and all I would say is that, um, you know, there is, as you, you, you talked about information and misinformation, don't forget that we spent 
the last four years politically talking about facts and alternative facts, news and fake news, information and misinformation. I mean, the same thing goes um, to uh, information with regards to what companies do in our sector. So people who are interested in investing in the sector, they need to, to cut through the noise and, and, and get to the bottom of, of what companies are offering. Um, I'm, I'm a bit old fashioned. I, I believe in, in cash flow and I believe in, in balance sheet strength. And, and that is clearly reflected in the way uh, NEO is operated. Um, and in fact, uh, our balance sheet saved us during the, the COVID turn down. Um, you know, we didn't lay off a single person. Um, we slowed down some of our plans, but we didn't shut them down. Um, and the result is we could afford to do it. And in our business, uh, one of our greater, greatest resources is human capital. And if you let people go, it's very expensive and it's short termism to just let people go if this quarter or next quarter don't look great because it's taken us decades to make sure that, you know, the people that work for us are the best anywhere. So, you know, letting them go would, would create a, a serious problem when things come back and we need them back. So we, we, we rarely let people go for external reasons uh, other than, you know, uh, performance related reasons. Uh, in, on, in, in terms of what other companies are doing, there, there are some uh, exploration companies that I really like. They have unique deposits, and those deposits tend to have excellent, either, either excellent mineralogy or an excellent distribution of the desirable magnetic type rare earths that today command the higher values. Um, then when it comes to technology in terms of separation, um, you know, separation is a relatively, in my view, and I might sound heretic in this, um, or heretical, uh, it's, it's not a very high value proposition. Um, if at the end of the day, what you do has to compete with the large commodity manufacturers in, in Asia, then, you know, there isn't a lot of margin to, to command just because you have a better separation technology. Um, you know, solvent extraction works really well. It's dirt cheap. And as long as you know what you're doing, it can be a fairly clean operation. Um, so when it comes to, you know, further downstream in, in the business, clearly um, magnet, anything related to magnets um, has a great volume demand. But again, at the same time, people who get into it, they need to compete against the large commodity magnet producers in Asia. So be very careful uh, when you're investing in a company, you need to look at their business plan and see how defensible it is against massive dislocations uh, like we've seen in the past. Uh, and I remember when Molycorp, uh, when Molycorp uh, filed for bankruptcy, when neodymium prices almost over a span of a couple of weeks went from $40 a kilo to $15 a kilo uh, back in 2015. And, you know, uh, Molly Court couldn't keep the lights on. Uh, on the other hand, um, if you have a defensible proposition with um, strong barriers to entry, then those companies are, um, are worth investing in. You know, I apologize for the generalities, but... I'm going to get into a lot of trouble if I if I say anything specific on that. I, I think the conclusion for your last comments are quite clear for most of us, which is just you're articulating clearly the value proposition in looking at neo performance. And as we've heard you say, you've invested properly. You're looking at M and A opportunities at this time, presently, uh, continuing as you've been doing. And what I would like to ask you is just for some highlights of what we as shareholders uh, should anticipate in this upcoming year, perhaps the next quarter or two. Is there anything you can comment on? Well, again, um, obviously I cannot share any non-public information. You know, in the, in the last press release we had um, announcing the secondary the, uh, that we did in, uh, earlier this month, we did have, there was a paragraph, um, 
and a lot of people may have missed it, that we saw a strong demand in the fourth quarter, uh, and we believe um, that our fourth quarter, um, our our fiscal quarter and fiscal year is calendar quarter and year, but we we expect that our fourth quarter numbers will exceed analysts' expectations, and this is what I was saying earlier. Um, you know, this is this is public information, um, and it is really supply chains, automotive, electronics, coming back after you know and, and taking advantage of sort of pent up demand. You know, when when people lock down, they stop buying things. So as the lockdown started relaxing, people started buying cars and uh, and electronic uh, devices, and. I, I, I would be very hesitant to, to to make any projections for 2021 because it's so de- how things will unfold it's, it's so dependent on how successful the world will be uh, against COVID. I mean, if the vaccines work well and if people get vaccinated and we can start acting like normal humans again, then I'm very bullish about our business. But if we if we see you know, plants shutting down uh, with with cases and people, you know, and, and people being locked down in in their homes uh, for the rest of the year. I don't know. All bets are off. You know, I, I all I'm saying is, you know, we'll continue to have a very conservative balance sheet <laughs> because you never know how things uh, unfold. But you know, I, at this stage, I would say I'm cautiously optimistic that. You know, things will continue to unfold as planned and as hoped for, uh, where the COVID um, uh, situation will continue to improve. But that's more of a hope than uh, than speaking just sheerly on the fact. Well, as always, Constantine, thank you so much for an update on Neo Performance Materials. Thank you, Tracy.